and I must say that in the process, while working on this topic, my sources have changed, so that the description given in the conference handouts is a bit outdated. Sorry for this. Nevertheless, the title is the same, so I hope it won't be confusing. When in his untimely meditations, Nietzsche wrote, I quote, we are all consumed by the fever of history, it was the expression of the idea and feeling that would become crucial in the modernist Weltanschauung. To some extent, it paradoxically meant that one can be modern only by getting rid of history, to escape from it, as it was manifested in the title of the, of the seminal Flight Out of Time, that is, Diary by Hugo Ball. Futurism, whether Italian or Russian, was perhaps the only artistic movement that would bring this temporality issue, or better say paradox, <coughs> in the forefront, as the name Futurism suggested. Yet, in my opinion, the intention of Futurism was not at all prognostic, it's hardly a function of art, and oriented to the future, as it comes to mind first. But it was to close the gap between past, present, and future by dehistorizing them in the sense that is used in the poem by Osip Mandelstam called The Century. Let me quote um, some lines from it. To wrest the century away from the bondage, so as to start the world anew, one must tie together with a flute the knees of all the knotted days. It's worth noting that it is art to which Man uh, Mandelstam ascribes the power to tie together the knees of all days thus relating art and modernistic temporality closely. In the futurist opera uh, Victory Over the Sun, this will may be seen in the character of the traveler who rides through all centuries and sings a song. The reason for this, perhaps, is understanding art as the ultimate creative ability, the potential to originate new worlds and thereby to start the world anew. I quoted Mandelstam here to show that Futurism was at the very source of this spirit, linking up temporality and art, or to be precise, having faith in managing temporality with the means of art. Before we analyze the dehistorizing process in the framework of Futurism and find out in what way a creative act makes it possible, let me first make one preliminary remark considering the future tense in Futurism. Throughout the first half of the previous century, it has been several times claimed that Futurism, especially Italian one, was kind of impressionistic present presentism, or as Rosalind McKeever yesterday marked, it contained presentist temporality. We can certainly argue that this presentist feature was determined by regarding all up-to-date technological and urban realms as the blueprint of some new age. And this explanation is partly correct for both Futurisms. However, we can understand the present as fe feature dif differently. Not as promise for the future, but as a way to experience the present fully, more deeply, to feel oneself at the edge of time. Futurist writings show that exactly this feeling, to be, so to say, at the core of the contemporaneous, was more overwhelming than representing naive visions of the future the way 19th century science fiction did. In this context, pessimists, against whom the literary battles were initiated, symbolized the hindrance to reach this edge of time. But to put it more generally, pessimists symbolized not just the past, but the burden of history, which didn't let to start the world anew. But how does this presentism relate to archaic structures mentioned in the title of my paper? In the recent essay, What is the Contemporary, Georgia Agamben elucidates this relation, I quote, Contemporaneous inscribes itself in the present by marking it above all as archaic. Only he who perceives the indices and signatures of the archaic in the most modern and recent can be contemporary, end quote. He then clarifies, no, this uh, a long citation, it is in this sense that one can say that the entry point to the present necessarily takes the form of an archaeology. And they call an archaeology that doesn't, however, regress to a historical past, but returns to, the, to that part within the present that we are absolutely incapable of leading. 
What remains unlived, therefore, is incessantly sucked back toward the origin, without ever being able to reach it. The present is nothing other than this unlived element in everything that uh, is lived. That which impedes access to the present is precisely the mass of what, for some reason, we have not managed to live. The tension to this unlived is the life of the contemporary. And to be contemporary means, in this sense, to return to a present where we have never been." End quote. One may notice that the connection between unlived element and the present resembles, to some degree, psychological approach, echoes archaeological method devised by Michel Foucault, and even goes back to Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche's uh, critique of history. What is more important in our context, it may explain why both futurisms paid such attention to, uh, to the mess of what we haven't managed to live, as Agamemnon said. Or, as, as I would paraphrase Agamemnon's words, mess of what culture has not managed to live. That is what generally regarded as the future resources, urban life, noise, signboards, children's babble, folklore, to name but a few. And that's why the attention to this unlived was so essential to futurists who strived to experience, reflect, and recreate contemporaneity. Now let's go back to archaic. In Greek, arche has definition of origin, beginning, source of action. Agamben use, uses it in the most general sense, which is the origin. And it means, as we have already noticed, that the origin is not only situated in a chrono chronological past. Perhaps here lies the main contradiction between Russian and fu Italian futurism. While Budetliani, people of the future, tied together with the fluid the knees of all the noted days, keeping in mind Mandelstam verses, Futuristi explicitly excluded chron chronological past, though it revealed itself in various forms. Worth mentioning here the disagreement Marinette had with Budetliani upon his visit to Russia. According to him, Italians were oriented to the future and the Russian futurists mainly to the past. I quote, Futurism is the art of the future, but you reach some prehistoric language. No, it's not futurism, but return to the aesthetic past, recalled David Burluk in Marinette's words. Um, for this reason, Budetliani could not be regarded futurist per se, in his opinion, Marinetti. The recollection of it one may read in a well-known book with the self-speaking title uh, The One and the Half-Eyed Archer, written by Benedict Lifshitz. Lifshitz uses the symbol of the One and Half-Eyed Archer not only to give an idea of connecting Asia and Europe, but as I can see, the connecting past and future as well. Remarkable is that the symbol ascribed to Slavic futurism by Lifshitz has distinctly mythological nature. This appeal to mythology is very common in futurist texts. Victory over the Sun, the so-called opera, but rather a quasi opera or anti-opera stage in 1913, has apparent mythological references in the text itself, in its composition, and in the stage form. I must say that over some 20, 30 years, there has been at least a dozen of interpretations of this piece, and only one Russian scholar, Galina Gubanova, succeeded in mythological interpretation. However, as far as I know, her works are still not translated into English, and generally this mythological issue was passed over in silence in recently published in English volume of articles dedicated exclusively to the opera. <coughs> the book uh, is called uh, Victor of the Sun. It's a very thick one. Nevertheless, I think the method uh, of assorting main characters of the opera according to po possible mythological or even Christian prototypes, the method that Gubanova adhered, is insufficient and not infrequently may lead to imprecise or even wrong conclusions, as it was with the comparison of Victory over the Sun with uh, St. John's Apocalypse. I guess that the misleading part of it is giving too much attention to concrete episodes and characters, but underestimating the overall structure. In order to comprehend complex temporality meaning of the basic futurist texts, we should not re read them just as the text inheriting mythological names, numbers, uh, paraphrases, etc. More important, in my opinion, is to analyze with archaic structures fut uh, futurists use and why how futurists use these uh, archaic structures and why. 
My use of the word combination archaic structure instead of mythological is deliberately narrowing, since arche, in the sense of origin, directly refers to the question of temporality, what I've been trying to demonstrate quoting Agamben's study of contemporary. Returning to the point, we may assume that the dehistorizing tendency in futurism in general means annihilating this historical development, zeroing history, recalls a um, very well-known zero form in the Malevich theoretical writings. So, annihilating historical development in order to generate a new beginning, a new spring, as Lifshitz wrote. It is in his writings we come across astonishing lines. I quote, upon returning to the origins, history originates anew, end quote. The striving for these origins are clearly seen in the opening words of Victor over, uh, over the sun in the dialogue between two strongmen. All is well that begins well, says one, and asking, what about the end, receives an answer, there will be no end. One brief uh, digression concerning this inf infinite beginning topos. Moon and electric light, so typical of futuristic iconography. One may recall Marinetti's manifesto, Let's Kill the Moonlight, Carlo Ca Cara's pictures, or the Russian futurist collection, Croaked Moon. Leaving aside the obvious hostility to romantic and especially symbolist aesthetics, this opposition represents moon as a source of instant transformation and often decay, which is typical function in, in mythology, and on the other side, electric light, so the position between moon and electric light, certainly not found in any mythology, which in this contraposition represents permanency, electric light as permanency, and that means overcoming transformations and any type of regularity, which is distinctive feature of nature, and the initial point of some unending beginning. The fact that this beginning is conditioned by electricity, by the technology, the second nature, is another vital issue. The renewal of the creation lies in the core of the futurist ideology and resembles eschatological and cosmological functions in many religions and beliefs. Where, as Mircea Eliade claimed in Myths, uh, Dreams and Mysteries, exists, I quote, an obscure striving to transcend one's own local, provincial history and to recover some great time. And what is particularly interesting in this perspective, in archaic structures, uh, structures there always something has to occur before this creation takes place. In his classical myth of the eternal re return, Eliade gives numerous examples of rituals, which may include exor uh, exorcism, initiations, and so on, and so on. He argues that in the most cases, whether it, uh, it is rituals existing in different societies or it is mythological texts, there has, uh, there has to be some special experience that would mark the transition from the present state to the initial stage. Futurism distinctly reproduces this structure in both texts. Italian Mafarka and Russian Victor of the Sun are common in representing them. This essential element is naturally the walk. Both texts, mentioning many, uh, not, uh, not mentioning many others, contain very important passages on war issue. Let me remind that victory over the sun starts with the militaristic statement. We're striking the universe. We're arming the world against ourselves. We're organizing the slaughter of scary crowds. This martial motive is noticeable all through the play, and uh, until the end, the sun is defeated and some new beginning, beginning starts, or at least proclaimed. The same is with the Mafarka, uh, the futurist, whose main character, Mafarka Elbar, is as known as an African king and war leader, who wins numerous victories, vividly depicted in the novel, and finally his absolutely mythological creature, Gazurmach, leaves planet Earth that is devastated to disappear forever. The novel ends with a description of a flight of this techno Icarus up in the sky. Very close to it, images and motifs of liquidity, metaphors of flooding, and etc., which are common in both texts. Just one brief example from uh, Victoria over the sun. The lake sleeps, plenty of dust, flood. Look, everything became masculine. 
the lake is harder than iron. Do, do not trust all measurements, old measurements. In terms of comparative mythology, war and water serve as the allegories of chaos decomposition, which inevitably precede mythical rebirth. The same function is realized in two catastrophes, the crash of unharmed aviator in Victor of the Sun and practically unharmed Marinetti after car crash, described in the first Futurist Manifesto as the real bi biographical fact. There are many more structural similarities to deal with, of course, not mentioning epiphenomenal features. Let me just name them. The syncretic quality of performance, the way actors moved on the stage, sung, the way music played and stage that designed, all of this could have looked like some odd collective ritual. Actually, according to Mikhail Matyushin, collectivity, so typical of, of archaic creative consciousness, was one of the main principles during the work on the piece. Another interesting thing in comparing mythological and futurist texts is the way poetical level and scientific level, or uh, quasi-scientific level, are combined. And largely overlooked aspects in the same mythological context, the elimination of position between the subject and the object, very typical to uh, mythological issue, the aspect which can be easily shifted into semiotics. Seeking correspondences between mythological consciousness and futuristic ideology, or to put it differently, mm, tracing the elements of mythological elements in futuristic consciousness, we can leave out three main and interrelated, we cannot pardon, leave out three main and interrelated problems. The first one is that putting futurism into a mythological framework brings the question how futurist contemporaneity and demand for novelty corresponds with the basic character of archaic ontology, repetition and imitation of the actions of some sacral event. Second problem is that futurism uses or rather appeals to archaic structures directly or latently and resembles them in order to construct its own mythology. The main point here is that the fact of referring to arche to some initial reference point in futurism is similar to mythological consciousness, which is based on, on correspondence with Arche. Third problem, and the last one, is that the reference point in futurism in the past or in the future, the initial stage to create, is not predetermined by any real mythology, any ontological essence. This way, initiating extratemporal moment, futurism just reconstructs the image of returning to Arche. However, the repetition itself doesn't occur as it does in mythological consciousness. According to principles of futurism, it certainly doesn't have to occur, since futurism's main goal is to create, but not to repeat, according to some ideal, which is pessimist in futurist terminology. And that is how the essence of myth becomes its structure, so that one and half-eyed archer becomes the symbol of loosely joined myth and creation with bow aimed at future or for the future. Now concluding with this magical number three, I thank you for your attention and leave space for, for the discussion. Thank you.